So uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to, to introduce uh, Heather Kenyon, who is the CEO and president of the Tampa Bay Tech Forum. I knew it was something. It was one more word at the end. Tampa Bay Tech Forum, who's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, creating jobs, particularly through a female founder perspective. And uh, from our experience at Startup America, we know that 50% of the population, actually slightly more than that, is made up of women. But um, a, a much smaller percentage of them uh, take on the kind of lead founder role. What, what I'm proud to say here at Startup America is that we have uh, roughly 30% of the uh, of the founders who are members of Startup America, um, we have about 9,300 9, members right now, um, are women and women-led startups. It's actually a pretty significant percentage. So we're really excited to have um, a significant percentage of our members uh, as uh, female founders. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Heather and she'll walk through the panel and, uh, and then be ready to ask questions. All right. Thanks, Heather. Thank Here you, you go. So yes, my name is uh, Heather Kenyon. I am the CEO of the Tampa Bay Technology Forum. We are a membership organization of about 300 member companies um, and uh, thrilled to be here and certainly thrilled to be here to facilitate a conversation between these wonderful dynamic women. We've already had a few conversations beforehand, so it should be a spirited discussion. So <laughs> needless to say. So um, if you can do me a favor, if you can each go down and kind of introduce yourselves and your company and just tell a brief snippet kind of about your company and... and, uh, and just maybe one of the things that, um, maybe something that you've been very proud of, an accomplishment that has occurred maybe in the past couple of years that you're very proud of. Good morning. I am Debbie Barker, and my company is Flipfold LLC. Um, I started a business by solving a problem, by inventing one product on my kitchen counter, and then the whole thing went crazy, and now this one product is sold all over the world. It's made in America, and that's one of the things I'm really, really proud of. But it started right here on my kitchen counter solving a problem, and I bet if you find a problem to solve, you could start a business too. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Rhonda Shear, and I'm president of Shear Enterprises. Um, it's Rhonda Shear Intimates. I have, um, I started uh, Intimate Apparel uh, Company with my husband. 11 years ago. It's a love story and a business story. Um, I was living in Los Angeles as an actress for 26 years. I hosted a show called USA Up All Night. Some of you all may know me from that. Some of you may not. A lot of big hair, a lot of cleavage. Um, <laughs> and then I was in LA and I finally realized that my mother realized that I needed to get married that I was like over 40 and it was like really depressing to her. <laughs> so um, my junior high school sweetheart reached out to me through classmates.com. And I just wanted to, you know, torment him because he broke up with me as a kid. So we got together and I said, are you kidding? The first kiss, we got married and didn't really think it through at all. He was living in Lafayette, Louisiana. I was living in Beverly Hills. So here I had been on a series for years. He had been a businessman and entrepreneur himself, starting up many businesses. And it was then, okay, this is great. We want to spend the rest of our lives together and work together. What can we do? And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I've always loved the intimate apparel business. I hate bras, though they're uncomfortable, so, and I changed body types through the years, so I invented a bra and created a bra called the Ah Bra, which many of you hopefully have seen on infomercials and other places. The bra is now the number one selling bra worldwide. We've sold over 25 million um, of these bras in 34 countries. We're international, and it's really exciting to solve a problem that's helping women. So for years, um, the show catered to getting young boys through puberty, mm -hmm. and now I'm um, loving that I'm helping women and breast cancer survivors, and it's just an amazing business. So we're located right here in, um, in the Tampa Bay area in St. Petersburg. We moved here for HSN, which is Home Shopping Network, and it is great to have started, not only found love later in life, after 45, but to also have recreated and reinvented myself and started a whole nother career, which is totally invigorating and, and, and exciting for me. And didn't you uh, recently win an award? Uh, yes, I'm very excited to say that um, I received the Ernst & Young um, Entrepreneur uh, for Consumer and Product Goods, and we're going to nationals in November. I'm very excited about it, along with some other awards. It's been an exciting 2012, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Kristen McLean. I'm the CEO of Bookagee. We are a Miami-based high-growth tech startup that develops analytics and disruptive products <coughs> in the book publishing industry. Uh, we are pretty atypical for many of the companies in Florida in that we're, we're sort of much more of the kind of company that you would see coming out of New York or San Francisco. 
Uh, we're a C corporation. We've got shareholders, and we just uh, are putting finishing touches on a $500,000 angel round right now. Um, I. I'm always asked about why we're here and not in New York or not in San Francisco. And um, we started here because I, I love Miami. I'm not originally from Miami, but I'm, I, I moved down to Miami and I'm an 18 year veteran of the book publishing industry. And I founded Bookagee to really attack some of the problems that I have experienced in the publishing industry. And I feel really committed to trying to build this company in Florida because I think that uh, there is a lot of interesting opportunities for early stage startups here. Um, I think the question becomes, apropos of the last panel, whether or not companies can scale here. Um, companies that, uh, you know, if we really want to build these kinds of companies in Florida, how do we support them? How do we build the infrastructure for them? And um, I think the proudest thing, what I'm most proud of is the fact that we have managed to scale the company to the size we have here in Florida already. And um, I'm, you know, I'm excited to be participating in um, this event today. So, thank you. I'm Patricia Dominguez, and my company is Triage Partners. We are a technology-enabled services provider to the telecommunications and cable companies. We actually do voice, video, and data installation within residential. We um, do fiber within commercial businesses. And we do innovative projects, that's what we're known for. We develop systems around our services so that we can provide the business intelligence to make better decisions, not only for ourselves but for our customers. So I'm going to start with Kristen and um, ask you, you know, lots of people start companies and I think they, uh, they realize, wow, there are things that occur that I did not anticipate, some challenges and that sort of thing. What was the thing as what was the one thing that sticks out that when you started your company that was a challenge that you were not anticipating? Well, I think that, uh, you know, starting a C corporation from the ground up, if you have never done one before, is, is much more challenging than I think uh, the sort of mythology around startup culture leads you to believe, right? Everyone sort of has this idea that, oh my God, I can start the next billion dollar company at my kitchen table, and a lot of companies do that. But if you set out to, to build a very high growth, scalable company, the, the challenges that confront you as an entrepreneur right away, I mean, things like just doing your legal paperwork for an S-Corp um, is, is extremely prohibitively expensive. Uh, trying to build that kind of company here in Florida where we just don't have the legal and accounting infrastructure like they do in Silicon Valley or New York to support young startups. So trying to figure out how you're gonna pay for all those expenses up front, how you're gonna build a team and get the talent that you need, um, you know, I, Starting a, a startup is mostly, uh, is it kind of like a magic act, it's a conjuring act, right? You have an idea, you may have a really good founder, but a lot of it is just convincing people that you have what it takes to really get behind an idea and grow it and execute. And so um, I've actually found that that part is not the problem for us. It really is just how do we find the support and services and the biz good business intelligence and good advice for, for that we need as young companies, because you don't know what you don't know, right? It's very easy as a young company to make a critical misstep in the way you set up your company, who you decide to take money from. Uh, it's easy to get in touch with the IRS really quickly. So those kinds of things, I think, have been extremely challenging. We've been fortunate that we have good resources. But um, when I meet other young entrepreneurs who want to know how we've gotten to where we are now, my, that's get a great lawyer who knows, who knows. And, and that's not so easy to find in Florida. Well, Rhonda, you actually moved to Florida to, to start your company to get the support. Is that for the, my the business plan was no business plan. So I'm not saying that everyone should do that. Yeah, right. My business plan was, you know, to make a great living with my husband. I mean, right. this was a new career, starting over in a new place, and we find find Florida has been wonderful, and we've been able to find support. But we did start off on our own with twenty thousand dollars. That's it. That was it. That's how we started. And we, we actually reached out to HSN um, 10 years ago. Um, I had heard that there was a, the intimate apparel business there wasn't very big. They had lost someone that was in it. And so it was an opportunity. So I literally reached out from LA, sent some product, and they knew my name from television. And they said, well, we don't have anyone right here, so come on down. Literally, I sold out within minutes, um, 6,500 units. My husband went, wow, this could be good uh, with the margins. And then, because my background's television and acting and selling myself, the buyers brought us into the office and said, when can you be back? And I said, tomorrow. And my husband was like, you need product, sorry. Baby. And I'm like, product? I just want to be on TV. But anyway, that was my background. Um, but within a year, 
we, we learned, my husband though had the background as a businessman, put many businesses together and sold them as an entrepreneur. Many entrepreneurs do, get, got bored and moved on. If I would have been in this life, we would have owned all of them. But anyway, they're all still around. But this was exciting to me because we saw that obviously that there was a need for this. There was a need for um, an industry that was comfortable and sexy and attractive that made women feel really great about themselves. So I started designing from that day on and how we grew it, yeah, I mean, it's hard, really hard for us because minimums in the intimate apparel business are huge. So we can't manufacture, we manufacture a little bit in the States, but most of it is out of China. That kills us. We'd love to do more here. We can't at this point because we manufacture in the hundreds of thousands. Minimums are very, very high for us. So anyway, that was a challenge for us in the beginning. Like how do we meet these minimums of 5,000 items in every color and every size, blah, blah, blah. And um, we started working with factories that were like us. They were startups, little, that they needed the business. And so pretty much it was that old Southern mentality. We're both from New Orleans on a handshake, a little trust, back and forth. We built our own business and kept putting our own money back into it. We were very frugal. We were very careful. And we are, we were, we are self-financed from day one to now at this point. And so it's been a very exciting journey. Um, for us, you know, starting off literally selling 6,400 units. Our last, uh, again, we sell on television, but we sell in retail stores now. We're all over the country and the world in, in retail. But um, starting with 6,400 units to we have 2,400 SKUs now. And we, like our last Today Special, which is the sale of the day on HSN, was 120,000 units, four items in each unit. So. Mm -hmm. It's grown. It's a need. It's a necessity. We, I always tell young entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs at any age, because I don't think I think you can start over at any age, is that you just, you know, keep your eye on the ball, keep focused, and we took our money and just kept putting it back in, and ate a lot of beanie weenies for the first year or two, mm -hmm. but it's okay. <laughs> so, were you eating beanie weenies when you were doing things in your kitchen counter, or how how did you start? And what challenges did you have? Well, you know what. I always tell people, I want to start a business, I have an idea, and they think these big grand right. things in the very beginning. I had one problem, and I started this company by solving that one problem. I was a mom, I mean, I had retired for a little while to raise my two daughters, and um, you know, as a mom, and I'm sure a lot of you parents know, that starting, getting your kids to do anything is not the easiest thing in the world. All I wanted to do was get my kids to do their laundry. That's it. I didn't have big aspirations. They could wash their clothes, they could dry their clothes, and they would leave them in the laundry basket. And I'd say, girls, come on, fold your clothes. I'm an ex-retailer, you know, fold your clothes, put them in the drawers, you're not going to look wrinkled. We can't. So, out of desperation, I went into my garage one day and I got this big cardboard box. And I cut it up into four little panels and I taped them together. I said, you know what, here's a template. Put your shirt on this cardboard box and flip it just like this and it will fold your shirt to be the same size because one was a tennis player, one was a dancer. I mean, they went through clothes in Florida like you wouldn't believe. Well, I gave it to them and they went, oh. And they took their shirt and they laid it and they flipped these little panels and their shirt was folded. And every week, I was making, an, actually every couple of days, I was making another one. I could have folded the clothes faster, but I was a, getting them to do a chore that otherwise they wouldn't have done. So one day, my daughter, Kristen, who's right over here, turned around and looked at me and said, Mommy, I learned about patents in school today. You should patent this product and sell it to everybody in the world because this really works. Well, I looked at her and I picked up the cardboard and I went to my husband who was um, senior executive best price president of SunTrust back then. I said, I said, what is this? He goes, what is that thing the girls are using? I go, well, I made it for them to fold their clothes. You put your shirt on it and then you flip the panels and it folds the clothes. And voila! <laughs> millions and millions of flip folds later. Millions and millions of people are folding their clothes just like this. But, you know, it took a little while to get from that to this. And, and I'll tell you how that happened. Um, when we first made, um, I was making that. I'm just going to go to sleep. Okay. <laughs> when we first made our um, first full pose out of cardboard, then we said, okay, we have to make them out of something a little bit more sturdy because we can't make them every few days. So we actually went to a plastics place and I said, and um, my husband said, okay, let's kind of do some research and um, 
we um, got some plastic cut, these four panels cut into plastic. And then we bought some hinges from another company. And we made our first 200 flip folds in my garage in a family assembly line with friends and family. We had an assembly line just like GM. OK, you stick the footers on. You put the hinges on. You put the panels together. That's what we did. And um, we had 200 made. So OK, I had all this plastic, maybe about, hmm? Oh, OK. The holes are really important. That's, that's a good question, too. So um, we put all these together. And um, I had a friend who was in the t-shirt business. And he was going to Vegas to do a trade show. So um, I said, I'll give you um, $500 if you let me have a table in your trade show. Well, we had these were so labor intensive to make, we had to sell them for $75 each. I shipped the plastic out to the trade show, a bunch of t-shirts. I got the table, people walked by, and I sold all 75, of my, I mean, all 200 of my $75 flip folds that first morning. Came home and my husband goes, I think we got something. <laughs> <laughs> so we filed for a patent, we filed for a trademark, and we kept making them one by one and went to big companies. My first big company I went to was a sports authority. And I tried so hard to get in there, but nobody would listen to me. Oh, I said, I have something that will fold all those t-shirts you have to fold like in five seconds. And they said to me, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I got hung up a lot of times, but finally I had a friend in accounting who worked for Sports Authority, and I gave her a $100 gift certificate, and I said, get, <laughs> get me into the buyer. Get me into the buyer. And um, I did. And so this buyer was like this. He looks at me, and he goes, you have five, you go, you have five minutes. I said, I only need five seconds. So I went into him, and I laid my flip fold. Excuse me, can I take that away? OK. I took my flip fold just like this. And I took my t-shirt, and I laid it flat on the board, just like this, fold the bottom of the shirt to the edge of the board, and I did flip, 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 and fold in five seconds. Perfectly folded shirt. There it is. <laughs> so anyway, the holes are real important because they make it aerodynamically correct. My first holes were made in my cardboard with a screwdriver because what happened when Kristen was folding, she got to fold it so fast. And when she went over, it would suck the shirt right back open. So my engineering mind, which I have none, um, figured out if I put holes in it, it would work. So that's how the flip fold came to be. And we made them, and we made them, and we put them together, and we went to different um, we had different people, you know, we had to move out of the garage. <laughs> we couldn't do that. And we made more and more. Well, millions and millions later, we sell it at Home Shopping Network, countries all over the world. It's a patented product made in the US, all from one problem. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, what's interesting about that is I used to work at the Gap, and I, mm -hmm. like, I tease all the time I can fold shirts really fast, but they would have the t-shirt the squares. Mm -hmm. So this is just a better mousetrap, basically. It is a better mousetrap, and you know, the great thing, it works every time, and no matter who's folding, right. you know, your husband, which is amazing because they will fold, or a monkey. Everybody will fold to the exact same dimension, and it works. It works on pants, t-shirts, it works on absolutely everything you had to fold. Now. You know, uh, one. We don't sell them for seventy-five dollars. We don't sell them for seventy-five dollars. Yeah, They're yeah. sold for for nineteen dollars each on our website, and we sell them on Home Shopping Network and some very select retailers. And we've extended our brand because on Home Shopping Network they came to me and they said, Debbie, people go, Debbie's such an organizer. What else could she come up with? So I invented line extensions, which is very important when you're you're um, right. growing a business, as Rhonda does so very much. Uh, my next product that I got a patent on is called the Flip and Dazzle. And it's a jewelry case that unfolds. It holds 200 pieces of jewelry, but it folds down to the same size as a flip folded shirt. So you could then hide your jewelry among your folded shirts, towels, or everything else that you're folding. So, you know, it's kind of like I always say it's the American dream, and dreams yeah. aren't always happy times. There's some dark things around the corners, which we have run into, but we got through it. So, on my kitchen counter to homes all over the world. You can do it, too, if you have a problem that you need to solve. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a sock matcher? Because that's what I need. A sock matcher? Yes. Yeah, so no, you but you work. can fold your socks with a flip fold. <laughs> and even, it's been on the Big Bang Theory. I don't know if you've ever seen that TV show. It's an integral part of their show, Sheldon, oh. who's like the real nerd. He <laughs> folds his socks with it. So. It's, 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 awesome. it's finding the matching sock out of the dryer. Exactly. <laughs> that someone needs to do a solution to that. Because mm -hmm. there's always many, one, one single socks. Women, one, get on it. Get on. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, exactly. Do that. So, so Pat, um, 
we, we, we've been talking a lot, but um, <laughs> but I, I've known Pat for many years. So um, I, I and uh, my question to you: obviously, your product is much different than theirs. I mean, you know, so your product is people, basically. So how how tell me about kind of tell me about your progression because you were working in a big company. Again, I, I've known you a long time, so I know your story. But you worked at a big company. What led you to the decision to become an entrepreneur? And then again, what challenges when you started your company? That sort of thing that. Um, you know, I know you had opportunities, but certainly there, there are challenges that lay in wait for you as well. So can you talk a little bit about that? I decided to start my company. I, I always had ideas. I was always trying different things during the course of time. However, I was a single parent, and quite honestly, I couldn't afford to take the risk uh, many years back. So I was working at a large company. Finally, my youngest was in college, and I thought, you know, now was the time. As uh, Nike so often says, just do it. So I decided that my background was information technology. And I knew that I wanted to stay within that realm uh, because it was something that I had grown up with. And many years back, very few women were clearly involved in that. Bottom line, at that point, I developed an IT staffing company. But as, and I started out of my home upstairs, you know, and um, as I started to grow and move in different directions, I then wound up doing more and more in the telecommunications field. And so many times, as they'll say, your customers will take you where you need to go. Uh, they're the ones that will come up with ideas, and our philosophy is we can do that. And by doing so, we became known as a very innovative supplier. Moving forward, you know, it was the, the typical progression if you're a startup company. Uh, I mean, you, you start in your home, if you're self-funded, uh, moving then into a small, office space, then somehow managing to put three desks in that office space, and then continually moving forward into something that was larger and larger. Um, basically, it was really, regardless of who you are, what you do, you have to be able to perform and demonstrate that you have quality, whether it's quality product or quality services. Oh, that's really important. And my, uh, with my background, in providing services, we always approached it from, how can we track this? What can we do? How can we manage it more efficiently? And how can we ensure that we're really doing what we say we're doing? Merging the two, the IT background and developing those systems, uh, we became no noted for being a technology-enabled services provider, meaning that we can manage our services from anywhere. Uh, I now have two offices out in California. We're in Texas, here, Atlanta. And we provide installation services to very, very large companies, uh, you know, the largest in the world, actually. Certainly not as um, what I would consider exciting in some ways as yours, but the benefit that we had was being able to continually grow with that. Uh, having, I still own my company 100%. I didn't, um, I, like you, I kept investing in it. Right. Uh, so the challenges that happen along the way, you know, I think any time you start a business, any time you go out on your own, there are always challenges. To say that there is any one specific challenge that sticks out in my mind would be very difficult. Uh, it, the challenge today is so different than it was maybe four or five years ago. However, what I really would say is that it takes perseverance and it takes being extremely uh, dedicated because when you have your own business and when you first start it and even as you continue forward, you have to have that ability to persevere. And I always feel as though success is based on how you get to the other side. The challenge is always going to be there. But if you continually put one foot forward and keep pushing against it and get to the other side of it, that's your success, or what has been what I consider my success. Um, fortunately, in, in the course of the period of time that I've been doing this, which actually I started my business nine years ago, and um, you know I, I would have to ditto what you said. Nobody's ever too old to do it, to do anything that you want to do. And don't we live in the greatest country in the uh, world that we have the ability to do that yes. and to move forward and do anything that we choose to do? So. Absolutely. I continue to go in that direction, continue to provide quality, continue to develop uh, the relationships, and continue to build on my reputation because that's what it really is about. It is. It's, it's, it's a passion, which you have, which all of us here, a passion and a desire, and, um, and also finding, not a challenge, because I mean, I've, I always look at the 
glass half full, as all of you seem to. Um, but getting the best team. I mean, we start, it was my husband and I that started. Then we had a second employee, then a third. And now we have 25 employees. We started in our uh, bedroom, the second bedroom office. And now we, we did the same thing. We have our own um, 20,000 square foot facility here in St. Petersburg or in St. Petersburg. And it's, if you can't invest in yourself, and believe in yourself, you know, you, that's, what, that's what our mantra is. I mean, now we're at that point now where we have grown, and you're right, expanding mm -hmm. your business and, and doing like we're now going into the, the fragrance business and the cosmetics business. We also do some, um, uh, you know, manufacturing for other companies. So you start to expand, but keep doing the same, you know, what you know and what you believe in. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep your eye, on, Keep the your ball. eye on the ball. And be passionate. Like, mm -hmm. I, I eat, drink it, and sleep it. Like, my husband says, can you ever shut down? And I can't. Like, it's, it's like constantly, you know, I, if you love it and you believe in it, then you're not going to take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's largely about fear management. Fear, I, I, think yeah. of, I think of this whole Good exercise point. as being just one prolonged experiment in fear management. And, mm -hmm. and in, um, <laughs> you joke, but I like no, to ask true. my husband, like, no, uh, true. but we you know, it's true. yeah, and, and we talk a lot in the, especially in the community in Miami, um, about sort of the gut check. Like yeah. I think, I don't think I could have done what I'm doing now, maybe even 10 years ago, even though I've had a really long career um, in, in sort of corporate environments, like it takes a special kind of grounded belief in yourself in order to be right. able to step out and just keep doing it and appreciate the fact that even if you have a sucky day and you may, right. you, know, you just cannot let that stop you. Right. You just have to try to push it forward every day. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's really about process over perfection. Like mm -hmm. if I've moved my project forward even a little bit every day, even if it has been a terrible okay. day and I haven't gotten through what I want to get through, just getting up the next morning and just keeping mm -hmm. at it is critical. And I think that that you know, when you look at the companies, uh, when you look at the companies that are successful and you talk to early stage companies that have sort of made it to the next leap, you know, th they all share that, uh, especially absolutely. in their founder, the ability to just keep moving well, forward. Well, you know what, too, I think also, I think very important when you're starting a business is decide and find what you're really good at. Right. What are you strong at? And also define your weaknesses and then find the person who can fill those weaknesses. And I, I know a lot, Rhonda and I and our husbands are very similar in this. Rhonda and I are the creative, right. we're the upfront marketing. <clears throat> marketing people. Now, when it comes to crunching all those numbers and, and juggling all the dollars, you know, our, our husbands, luckily we found good partners in our husbands and that's their strength. So finding- And talking us off the ledge. Exactly talking us off the ledge and then you know actually my, my daughter is in our business with us and um, that she filled a void because you know we're from a different generation so she brought us to social marketing right. Facebook Twitter Important. so that was another void that we have so you have to look around and say what am I good at great okay let's put that over here what do I need help with who can take me to the next level? So finding the people that fill all these different voids is really important when you're building a business. Yeah. So, and I'm going to ask one blanket question about this because, you know, I find that in this day and age, particularly from my perspective, like it's not, it's, it hasn't hurt me being a woman in my career. So, but I have to ask like one blanket question because we're all women, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I preface this question with that. Um, do you feel that women entrepreneurs have different challenges than male entrepreneurs? And if so, do you think our political climate helps or hurts? Well, I'm, I'll start. Uh, do I feel that I had different, different challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I came out of the technology world. Uh, I remember, you know, 25 years ago showing up and they'd look at me and say, I thought you're bringing your technical person with you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, having to uh, overcome certain barriers, yes, absolutely. Um, going in and talking finance and, and getting, and if I bring a male along, it's amazing to me that the conversation will be directed to that right. person. Uh, do I find that there has been a significant change? Uh, I think it's slowly happening, but there's also a reason that women are categorized in the minority as a minority in large businesses today, a minority supplier. I didn't understand that at first. I thought, well, you know, why, why is that? But there is a reason for it, and it's because we do have different barriers to overcome. I think it's changing. Mm -hmm. I think that it's happening. Uh, you know, I talked to my daughter and, uh, you know, she has three children and even though I, there are many times I think that we've made significant change, sometimes she assures me that isn't so. 
So yes, uh, I do believe that there are some challenges. That being said, once overcoming those challenges, it's purely based on ability to perform. But, so then it's not gender specific, but it's getting through that main barrier initially. That seems to be a challenge for me. Uh, certainly doing something totally different than well, other it's people. It's the same. Here. I mean, I think it's, I think it's human nature. I mean, I did stand-up comedy for years. And, and it was human nature that the male comic would get more laughs than the woman because women are the maternal being. We have the lighter voice. We're, the, we're supposed to be the nurturers. And I think that's the same way in business that, that they still see the guy. I know financially I'm happy to, to, and I'm lucky that I do have a business partner that I can just say, hey, you be, you be the, you know, you can do the, the dirty work. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm lucky about that. But on the other hand, sometimes I use the fact that they think, okay, you're blonde, you've got cleavage, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes it's fun for me to actually use that and go in and go, whoo, because I'm the one who's actually, you know, I, I'm the one who communicates with our manufacturers and, and the factories and along with my husband, but you know, I get things done, but I sometimes like, for me, I like using, oh, I'm sweet and I'm the girl and I'm the woman, but bam, watch out, okay. don't cross me. So, I mean, I guess that's just kind of the nature, you know, human nature to be a woman and being able to use that. And just not taking no for an answer. Mm -hmm. um, you, well, know, and, go ahead. you know, no disrespect to Startup America, but I would ask that question back to the room right now because look around right now. When we were sitting here for the previous panel, every single seat in this room was full, right? It's not full anymore. We watched a huge number of people stand up and walk out. And, you know, in general, I don't like to participate on panels like this where it's women-only discussions because I find that mm -hmm. we, tend to, um, we tend to talk about things that we don't talk about in the male panels. Or we tend to sort of channel it back towards work-life balance. We tend to channel it back towards right. our challenges, our disadvantages. And I do believe that there are some. I mean, I have experienced them. I think the, the fact that this room is not completely full is one of those challenges. It's not a challenge for me personally right. as an entrepreneur because I have everything. I mean, we've been very successful, and I, I again, I, I think that you just have to be bold and get out there and trust that if you've got a great idea and you've got some money behind it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But um, and if you can prove that, right? If you can prove through your intelligence and your decision making that you are fit to to, to leave the company, then people stop asking questions. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's a huge barrier in business. Uh, just generally, and then we keep returning to these, these conversations because there is something, and I don't, I don't quite understand. Do, do you find in general that women help other women? I'm just, I'm just, I, I, mean, I know I'm, I'm not to, but just because I, I do, and yeah. what? Go ahead. No, I agree with you. I think that women do tend to help other women. Yeah. And go ahead. They give you I ideas. underestimate me because I'm a woman. I like that yeah, because no. I'm going to come back at you with the big guns. <laughs> right, right. That's, that's how I feel. And yeah. I do find mm -hmm. that women in business do reach out maybe on, a, on a, a, another level or you know women can, can hoard and, mm -hmm. and hold things but I do find that I'm you know going to these different events um, women in business women uh, enterprising women that you have these business women who started for all different reasons out of necessity single mothers but they really do help and share ideas um, so I do find that it is depressing that you pointed out that the boys left though I, I, I agree with that mm -hmm. you know I get them back here let's show them who's left. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I think there's an advantage, I have to say, to, to women who are interested in starting businesses. Like in, in my founding team, there are six of us, three are women. The CEO and the CTO are both women. And that makes us qualify for a tremendous right. amount of potential funding and attention, especially right. when you go right. to Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Right. So for mm -hmm. us, it's part of our story, and we embrace that part of it. But, I, but you know, I think that, I think, um, you know, I, I just think that there's a dialogue. You just have to be really careful about not constantly staring at that right. you're, you're you know, just women. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you've had tremendous success, and your bottom line is amazing. I, I, you know, I, I think most people who sat in this room at any time would mm -hmm. be proud and excited to be associated with somebody who has had such success. And mm -hmm. so that's, well, but you know, what, you know, what I always say is that I've used everything in my career, which started in show business, everything that I learned along the way, I still continue to use. And, and the ability to communicate and the ability to get the message across and, and then having the quality product. And of course, you always have every day, you know, ups and downs, but it's so exciting and invigorating. And in this country, to be able to start a country, a, a, a country and a country, um, a broad country, um, a company a decade ago and the growth that we've seen is just unbelievable. And Florida's been very good to us. Of course, we are international and we work out of here, but um, 
but being a female for uh, for me, of course, in my business, we're talking bras, panties, and yeah. undergarments. You, so you, you, you know, go with you what know. you know. That's, you know. <laughs> yeah. so it wouldn't be good if my hubby was up there showing the bras. What I was noting is um, you're finishing the final uh, of a $500,000 um, early stage investment, correct? Yep. So you are out of the four companies sitting there, you're the only company that has um, either pursued or has needed funding, um, according to the story so far. Would any of you have benefited from funding mm -hmm. at an yeah. earlier round? Is there a reason you didn't per pursue it? Um, because I was at a, a meeting not that long ago and they were talking about that although we are more of the population and women have an influence, we are the neck according to where money gets spent, um, we are still a minority. Most funding, um, early stage and venture capital, goes to white men. And so some of the organizations, we are um, uh, identified as a minority initiative in the funding right. arena. So my question is, you're getting funding and you knew you needed it. Could it have benefited you? And is there a reason why you didn't pursue it? Well, for us in the, re the, you know, the wholesale business, we didn't want anybody else to control. Do we need it? And we kind of wanted to jump ahead. I was ready to be to go retail in my first year. At least my husband, you know, we're like the tortoise in the hair. And he's like, we need to be ready. But, um, and someone told us a long time ago, if something sounds too good to be true, it is. People were offering. Okay, but that would mean that they would have owned our, our, um, our inventory. They could have decided what my designs were. And I didn't want that. I wanted the control. I wanted the business to go the way I wanted it, the way that we saw it going. And even when I have listened in the past, even at HSN at one point, um, like seven years ago, asked me to do a certain line. And I did. I didn't trust my gut. And we talked about this. Trusting your gut is the most important thing. And I didn't, tr I mean, I did trust my gut, but I went with what they asked for. And it was the only year we didn't see profit at HSN. So it's always trusting your gut. And for us, our particular business, we wanted the control and we didn't want anyone else to own our inventory. And that at this point has, we, we've only partnered in one project and that is our infomercial project because it's about buying media, tremendous amounts of media in a week. So we have a Canadian partner and they're publicly traded and so they've been very fair and square. But sometimes when you've got partners, it just often doesn't, I mean, it works out that I have a partner and happens to be my husband. For me, that's our personal story. And I'm really glad that we did it our own way, even though, yes, it was very lean. Cash flow was very lean in the mm -hmm. beginning, getting those products. But in the long run, for, for us, it worked out. Um, I, I, our story is very much the same. Um, my husband was in corporate life. and. We made a decision when we started this thing is we wanted to become the masters of our own destiny. Right. We didn't want to have to answer right. to a bunch of different people. We didn't want to be sitting in meetings all the time. But right. our, our products were also something kind of different. We, were, we had to see what worked. When we invented the flip fold, it was something that, you know, it's not another pot, it's not another pan. It's something that did something completely different. So what we did is we made a lot of profit and then we put the money right back right. in. Exactly. And we lived lean. We lived very, very lean but we felt that was a fair trade-off to mm -hmm. be able to make our own decisions because we didn't know where we were going we had a plan we knew where we wanted to go but we didn't we knew that it would be risky and to take that risk with other people's money we said you know what we'll be right. very lean in the beginning and we'll just keep going forward and we were able to self-finance same story growing a little bit slower but growing exactly. strong Pat, did you exactly. did you think did you consider taking financing at some point you know, I did. I guess if uh, if the question was, would you you know do it differently? I prob I would probably do it differently at a certain uh, point in my business, only because it allows you to grow at a faster rate. Yeah, a faster and rate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in listening to you, I, I think that that's probably every entrepreneur's dream. Everybody that owns a company, you want control. You know, you're able to make your decisions. You can do what you want to do and uh, lead it in the direction that you want. So many times you hear the horror stories. I mean, we've all heard them. Right. Somebody comes in, next thing you know, you're, you have a minority mm -hmm. uh, portion of the company. Oh, yeah. and, but then there's a lot of success stories mm -hmm. there. So I think what it really, uh, really turns out the, the, is you need to vet whoever it is that you're going after and who, you know, who is your partner really gonna be? And had I probably approached it that way, but I was so focused on my business during this period of time mm -hmm. that I was really continually, that, that was the benefit that I had. Uh, overall, I, you know, I did have financial consultants that came in. I did have them work with us 
Um, and you have to be careful with that as Absolutely. well. You know, because you sometimes don't get the right information. You wind up paying, you know, exorbitant fees because you feel like you're you're getting what you consider to be a good consultant. But um, overall, yeah, I, I I would have been able to grow faster. Um, and you know, when you're managing off a of cash flow, as I listened to them, it is very lean. You know, it is because you're constantly investing in your business. So you learn that. Um, you have to, there are just certain things that you have to manage through. You know, I, I think there's a myth, I think that it's really important to point out that there's a mythology of taking funding or getting, you know, I'm, we took funding, not financing, we took investment. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a difference. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that when you look at the statistics, the, very few companies, startup companies, actually take investment um, over the course of their lifetime. The majority of Companies are either funded by friends and family, funded by personal investments. Mm -hmm. You know, I happen to work in the tech sector and in, and in the publishing industry where we are scaling very fast and high tech growth um, requires capital. And we set out to build the company that way. But, I, you know, we, um, I've been really fortunate that I have a great team around me. My CFO, Glenn, um, his surname is right in the front row. Um, and we've been very careful about the way that we've structured our strategy and the way we are going to be taking on money because I think one of the mistakes that young companies make, especially if they're in tech, is that you know they make the mistake of thinking that you fail because you don't have enough money. And my experience is that, and so they take money because they're feeling desperate mm -hmm. um, or take it from anywhere because they just don't know enough about who, who, who they might be getting into bed with. And I think it's exactly the opposite that if you've got a great idea, my experience has been, if you've got a great idea and you have the ability to sell it and make the, the, the value mm -hmm. proposition clear, money is generally not the problem. Um, the, there are lots of other things around that mm -hmm. that are the problem. Um, you had a great idea. You, you guys have both had great ideas and you guys have made it, made it work. So, you know, I think it's a mistake to sort of buy into that mythology. Um, because I think there are lots of other ways to get your business off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I would say that one of the things that is most critical is not getting in bed with the wrong person oh. at the oh, wrong time. Thank so, you. so important. Yes, yes. So. Oh, no, another man. <laughs> uh, as a man in the women's world uh, <laughs> as well. No, just to amplify on one point that Kristen was making, one of the unsung benefits, I think, of taking angel investment uh, is the ability, if you surround yourself with the right people, is the ability to um, leverage and tap into the networks of the people well, that yeah. you are you know, bringing onto your team, and that's very much how we built the company. We don't take, we, we don't have a, uh, you know, anybody's money is green approach to uh, fundraising. So yeah. we've surrounded ourselves with the right people who believe in the pro project mm -hmm. and who are willing to bring their resources uh, into the company. You know, and also I want to just point out that um, I had one of my first co uh, com um, conversations about potential funding in Miami result in having the person who was looking at us tell me that I need to fire myself as the CEO, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And so, and that was, and, and it, it was uh, a bit of a gut check because I didn't think he was right, first of all, because I was working in an industry where I had 17 years experience and where I, I was pretty convinced that if it had been a guy standing in front of me, he would never ever have suggested that. Mm -hmm. So that was someone obviously who we didn't work with and, uh, and, and, and I still have moments where I just am looking forward to the day when I can just say, ah. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think that, that's, that that is something that you, that you run up against as a woman entrepreneur more often than not is that you have to sort of look at people who say, I don't think you can do it and, and make the decision not to work with them because they're not the right partner for you. So that's really critical, I think. So a number of you have mentioned um, having either working with um, spouses, men, having being very deliberate and having uh, a board or management that is gender diverse. And there's lots of actually studies more recently that show smaller companies, startups, and larger companies having diversity on all different levels really adds to the bottom line, frankly. What I find really interesting here, and I'm the CEO of Startup America, so I, I sit in front of and talk to, to entrepreneurs every day. How often, at least two of you have talked about your husbands, mm -hmm. your husbands, your husbands as being your business partners. Mm -hmm. And I think, and I'm, this is sort of a gross generalization, but what the heck, you know, we, women do tend to um, give credit, acknowledge, talk about the collaboration that we do. It's kind of what we do, or at least what stereotypically what we do. Is that a, so are, are those mentioned, and, and frankly, I don't hear male entrepreneurs talk about no. their, <laughs> hus their wives or their husbands. They just um, say, right, right. Or the people to whom 
you know, th the same kind of credit giving in the way that you do. And I wonder, if, you know, first, is that a deliberate thing? And is that something that you think has been helpful to you as you've grown your businesses? Or has it hindered you at all along the way? You know, um, I, I, I see what you're saying here. But, you know, he's my husband. He's my, he just happens to be the person I go home with every night. But if I were going to pick a business partner, the, he has the characteristics that I would have picked even if he weren't my husband. So I, if I referred to this man as Brad and never said um, the name husband, right. I think that would have been a little bit more effective in, in, in my presentation to you. And maybe that's... And it, yeah. it might mm -hmm. be my generation, mm -hmm. too. But um, yes, I mean, mm -hmm. I trust my husband implicitly. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying, you know, that you wouldn't feel that way about another business partner. But yes, you're right. So. Yes, we, we speak about it, the business, especially in our business, is 24-7, I mean, virtually. Um, but I do think it isn't just, and I do think women do give more credit, by the way. Yeah, they saying. do. We do. <laughs> um, I think that, again, that's that maternal thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also my team. And so when I do speak, which I do quite frequently on panels, my team of women that has taken 10 years, which is predominantly, we do have one tech guy, that, our IT guy is a guy who lives in his man cave, we don't see him much. But, um, <laughs> but everybody else, except my stepson, who's really embraced the business, and we love that. He, and gosh, he, he wanted to be here and he couldn't today. But anyway, long, I think my team is amazing, and I give these women credit, because there's no doubt that without them, we could not be growing the way that we're growing. I mean, we, we have to work with factories and coordination and shipping and handling and receiving. Mm -hmm. There's so many, I mean, the scheduling, it's just, it's crazy and it's huge. And my husband is, is one factor. It is 25 people working together as a very strong team. And women. It's all women yeah. except for a few, few people that we And, and it's in the same in, in, in my business, too. But I have to say that I have been sitting in the audience when my husband was up here on a panel. And I will tell you that my husband will be the first one to tell you this would never would have been if it were not for Debbie um, in, inventing and, and solving this problem. And he gives me equal, if not more, credit because this was the impetus. This is the thing that started. It was the idea. And um, he, you know, sings my praises as much as I do his. And it's a good partnership that I have with him. I'm just, you know, the funny, just happy to sleep with him. The, the, <laughs> funny, the funny thing, though, is that I have been getting all the awards. This I've gotten fastest growing female owned business. We were mm -hmm. the top three uh, for the Women's President's Organization. And thank goodness, Ernst and Young. And, Tampa Bay Business Journal, we just want, but I am the one who gets the credit, and mm -hmm. it is because we're the minority and it's the women, and I feel kind of bad because we are partners. Mm -hmm. And yes, it is though my vision. The line in my case is me, it is my vision, it is my design. So he, he is the, you know, we are business partners, but I am the front person for that business. So I can't help it, you know, as talk am about, I, as am right. I. Right, mm -hmm. so it's the same thing. I mean, everything that we do, I mean, mm -hmm. he is not designing any, part of the panty business. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't be good. But you know, I have to say another a funny th a thing is our daughter is in our business with us now and he is making sure that he is preparing her to take care of that other end right. that I am not good at. You right. know, he wants her to be more of a blend. He is He's immersing her more in the finance Two end of it. Two master degrees her daughters have. <laughs> and I, I mean, that's awesome. I mean, she, you've given them the, the education and the background, and that's awesome that you've prepared them. Yeah, yeah and, and they, they're trying to, they look at both sides of it a lot better. Like, she'll call me on that. And she'll go, well, you know, you really can't do that because, and I'll go, who are you? You know, <laughs> where that come from? Because I will hear that different financial and number influence there. Right. So again, what you said generationally, too, generationally, that comes into and play. And also, we started our business differently. I mean, mm -hmm. we started because we got married 11 years ago, and we had to start something together because we were both in two different you know, states. And so it, it, every business has a different reason, but I could not have traded this or changed this. Like, this is such a perfect part of my life and mm -hmm. that I'm doing this now. Like, I love this more than the show business thing, and I thought that was all I ever wanted to do was, you know, act. But anyway, that's... Well, I think yeah. it's also distinctive that you guys are actually doing so well and working together, because I'm sure there are a lot more stories where it hasn't gone as well, right? Oh, I bet. <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we still have our arguments, and I'm always right. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you understand that. Does anyone else have any other questions? Because I think we're actually up with on our time. Any other questions or any last comments you guys would like to make? 
if anybody of you are looking to start a business, go for it. Go yeah, for you know what? And I think, you know, it, I think that it. we kind of have a lot of varied. I mean, it's cool. I it's admire the unbelievable technical right. ability. I, I, I so lack in that. So I admire your vision of businesses. And mine's a low tech business. So if your business is low tech, if your business is high tech, you, there's all different types of businesses that can be started. And if you have passion about it, and if you have drive and you're not afraid to work hard, you can do it too. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Working hard. Okay, wait, hold on, hold on. We got one more question. One more question. Oh, oh I'm done wrapping up. I just want to mention uh, thank you guys. I, well, I want to thank Startup America, um, Kathleen, and your team. You guys are awesome. Um, Thank you, Heather. Uh, this has been great. Thank you, guys. Um, Startup Rock On. This is kind of our vision of getting these conversations started and elevating startups at a major uh, convention here and in Charlotte. So thank you so much. Um, any startups that want to stay and hang and talk with uh, American Airlines, we're going to do some office hours and talk about things that they can help us with as, as business owners and leaders. Um, so we'd encourage you to stay. But uh, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you guys for coming. And thanks again, Kathleen and Startup thank America. You. Thank 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 you. Thank